Darlie Routier was charged with two counts of capital murder. If convicted, she could face the death penalty. My kids have been killed. They're my kids. I'm wanting whatever it's going to take in order to find out who did this. Darlie said that there was an intruder, and I 100% believe her. I was in shock. I was completely blindsided. Just, I couldn't even grasp what they were telling me, that they were saying I was under arrest for murdering my children. Darlie's trial had been set the first Monday after January. So we had six months. I typically find that it's hard to be ready for trial in a death penalty case in less than a year and a half. It was going to be quick. There's no question about it. The crime scene tells a story. And it, it tells a hard story. And our thing is, that story's not the same story that she's telling. Skip Hollinsworth, a writer for Texas Monthly, followed the case closely. These are notes I wrote in the early spring of 2002 when I first began to get involved in the case. Tons of interview notes just to write one 6,000-word story for Texas Monthly Magazine. One event with 100 different perspectives, and everyone has some theory about what happened that no one else knows. Detectives suspected that someone inside that house in Rowlett had killed the little boys. It seems clear that despite the fact that she was stabbed in the neck, that investigators were focusing on her almost from moment one. So there were a number of things at the scene that led the investigators to believe that Darley was the one who committed this crime. Is your name Darley? Yes, Your husband's name Dan? Yes, Starting with the 911 call, there's a definite effort to classify Darley as a non-caring mother. One thing that investigators found very suspicious was a very odd comment that Darley made on the 911 tape regarding fingerprints. The knife was laying over there, and I already picked it up. Okay, it's all right. It's okay. We could have gotten the prints, baby. My reaction when I heard that one was of just of disbelief. She's got two children dying in front of her. Boy, that thing that comes to her mind is fingerprints. Common sense tells me no mother would ever make a statement like that. The only inference we could draw was she was setting up why you're not going to find an intruder's fingerprints on there. When Darley talks about grabbing the knife, it just sounds suspicious, like she's trying to cover for herself. But the question is, did someone ask her a question about that knife? And that's a mystery. You know, they make a big deal on the 911 call. Darley didn't say, oh, all this happened, 911, and oh, by the way, I've already touched the murder weapon. They left the knife laying on. There's a knife. Don't touch anything. I already touched it and picked it up. Remember, the dispatcher just told her not to touch anything. There's a knife. Don't touch anything. When she said, don't touch anything, it clicked in my head, you know? Oh, my gosh, I've just touched a piece of evidence. The strongest evidence of innocence are the photographs of Darley. In all the murder cases I've tried, I've never seen a self-inflicted wound uh, in the neck like that. I mean, just a fraction of a millimeter more that she would have bled to death. If you want to see a victim of a crime, that's the victim. She has a deep wound on the back of her right forearm. They are also the cuts on Darley's fingers of her left hand. This is typical of what you see in a struggle from trying to grab a blade and by somebody throwing their arm up to ward off a blow, that would be textbook defensive type injury. Everyone agrees that Darley had wounds, but prosecution and defense see them very differently. Prosecutors believe she wanted to make it look like she'd been attacked. It was a superficial wound. It just cut the skin. 
you look at the injuries to the boys, deep stab wounds that went through their entire chest and back area. Because we don't have a live witness to contradict the story, what we're going to have to rely upon is the physical evidence in the crime scene to do that for us. Another key item involves a broken glass. What she told the police was she woke up on the couch, and the man was standing over, her, and he attacked her on the couch. Darley Routier told the investigators that as the intruder was running through the kitchen, she heard a loud sound like broken glass. What's weird about that is that her blood is under that glass. Darley's blood, if anything, should be on top of the glass. It's underneath. The problem is every person that steps into that crime scene potentially contaminates it. Any crime scene like that is going to be chaos because the first order of business is to save lives. So whatever they push or shove aside or step in, that falls second. So using the position of the broken glass on top of the footprints to conclude that it was an inside job and she had staged everything doesn't make sense. Another huge issue is the screen. We go back to the screen that's been cut by this supposed intruder. There's no indication whatsoever that anyone either entered through that window or exited out that window. The dust that's on that window sill is undisturbed. If you assume that he exited out that window, he would have stepped very quickly into a flower bed with mulch on it. The mulch has not been disturbed. There are no footprints, nothing to indicate that that area has been traveled through at all. The prosecution said there was an intruder there. They said the windowsill, you know, was not disturbed. 20 years ago, Darren Routier demonstrated why the state's theory made no sense. Are you on? As you can see, there's no mulch underneath the window. The mulch is at least six to seven feet over in this direction. And this is the window sill that they said that was not disturbed. And as you can see, you can walk right through this window without disturbing any of the window sill. So the dust wouldn't have been disturbed. And there's concrete outside their window. So the mulch wasn't disturbed. It's just silly. There are just a lot of nagging things about this case that do not make any real sense. We analyzed uh, a lot of evidence. When you have a circumstantial evidence case, then it's all by little pieces of evidence that prove her guilt. They say there's a staged crime scene, self-inflicted wounds. That there's a cut screen. There was the broken glass. The 911 tape. And it goes on and on, the number of things that sort of lead you toward Darley. From the beginning, investigators themselves tended to focus almost exclusively on this uh, quickly developed idea that it was the mother who did it. And that basically meant that they didn't ever have to go out and investigate alternative suspects. And so the question becomes, if Darley didn't do it, who did? I saw this person's head turned, watching, just watching Darley's house. I started to walk towards the car. And they pulled out very abruptly. 